Hi everyone, my name is Lloyd and for the past few years I've been flying radio controlled helicopters using the Puma Generation 4 flight control system from Pro Flight Trainer. Recently, the folks at Pro Flight Trainer reached out to me and asked me if I could do the same thing with their Puma X flight control system and see how it worked in comparison to the Generation 4 system. So this video is how to build a custom wiring harness so you can use your Puma X to fly radio controlled helicopters. Some of the items I could use to complete this wiring harness include a donor radio. For this, I chose a DX8 from Spectrum. This is a radio that I had I was using as a buddy box and made an excellent donor. I bought a gun case from a local sporting supply store to put everything in so the radio never has to leave the box. I've got some Cat6 cable. This is a 12 foot piece and a six foot piece. The six foot piece will be cut in two and used inside the box. The 12 foot piece will actually be cut in two and wired directly to the flight control system. In addition to that, I've got some Cat6 pass-through pass connectors and that will allow the Cat6 cable to be plugged in from the outside of the box, which makes everything completely portable. To the CAT6 cable, you're gonna wire up two pin, three pin, and four pin JST connectors. These are all two millimeter size. This is what comes on the Puma X flight control system. And you need some heat shrink of various sizes, along with a soldering iron, solder, and flux. So before we go any further, we need to discuss just a little bit of electrical theory. Nothing crazy, just a couple of components and how they work. That'll let us understand how we're going to connect this wiring harness from our RC transmitter to the Puma X for flight controls. What we have on the left is a potentiometer. The way the potentiometer works is it takes a voltage in, in this case, five volts, a ground and an output. As the wiper continues along the resistive track, we then get the output that we need based on a zero or a positive five volts. Anywhere in between is the signal that our transmitter will read. The fourth generation Puma flight control system incorporated this type of potentiometer all over the axes for the flight controls. It, it, this is also included in the gimbal system of, for example, the Generation 1 DX8 that we're using as a donor radio. The downside to this system is over time, because there's a physical connection between the wiper and the resistive track, the output can degrade in accuracy. So you may get some plus and minuses over the output signal that you're really looking for. What Pro Flight Trainer has done in the Puma X is they've replaced the potentiometer with a Hall Effect sensor. The Hall Effect sensor is a solid state device where you have your, the same inputs and outputs. So you've got your five volts in, your ground, and your output. What they've done is they've mounted this to a plate that then goes over each flight control axis. What they do then is they take a magnet and they move that magnet relative to the pole and that will change the resistance that the Hall Effect sensor sees or develops and thus changing the output signal. Once that is done, the accuracy never changes because it's a solid state device. It either works or it doesn't. The good thing about this is because there's no physical moving parts, the signal never changes. It will always be as accurate day one to day 100. So it's a much better system. Okay, so now comes the brave part, cracking open your radio. Once you've actually taken the screws out and opened the radio up, you're gonna find where everything is plugged in with the gimbals. Some things are plugged in using duplex connectors or JST plugs. 
Other things I found were easier to just go in and find out where they attach directly to the circuit board. What I've done is I've drilled a hole in the back of my case to bring in the CAT6 cable. There's three of them here. I had a cable for future expansion that I never did uh, take advantage of. I found that I needed two cables, one for the elevator, aileron, and rudder, and then the other is for the throttle, which is also going to control the pitch in case of collective pitch helicopters, and a throttle hold and a bind button. The bind button comes into play when you're using FPV and head tracking for your camera. Once you take the sheathing off of a CAT6 cable, what you'll find is four sets of cables. So what I've done is I've assigned a function or a flight control to each color. I've designated brown as ground. So when that comes to feeding it in, I've used a multimeter and I've come in and determined where the ground is and I found that soldering it directly to the circuit board was my best option to get a good ground signal. When it came to the gimbals and where they plug into the circuit board, through some just looking at the where the gimbal wires go and using a multimeter to verify it, I found that the red wires were predominantly the five volt power along with the um, white wire being the signal. And I've come in here and I've started to label some of this and you can see where I've attached, for instance, the elevator to the blue cables that pass all the way through the CAT6 through my pass-through connector. Then they go out the second set of cables to the, the plug that actually get soldered on for the Puma. The difference between just screwing around and science is writing it down. So for me, my notes may not look very organized to some, but they make sense to me where I've gone and I've written down everything that I'm attaching and where it goes. I've added some servo connectors just to make it easier to pull the back of the case apart where things weren't just pulling and, and have tension on them all over the place. Some other functions that I decided to include besides the bind button is the throttle hold switch. The throttle hold switch is an important safety connection that, especially with helicopters, but I've used it for airplanes as well. You need to have a way to kill that motor. This thing is a big science project, and especially as you get bigger and bigger with the helicopters, you need to have a way to shut it off if things aren't going the way you want them to go. So just to sum up, I'm only utilizing two of these three CAT6 cables. I've color-coded each flight control with strands within the CAT6, and for me, I'm using brown as ground. For CAT1, using the primary flight controls, the aileron, elevator, and rudder, both of them are ground. For the CAT2, which includes the throttle, pitch, and throttle hold, I elected to just, just use one ground. I only needed one on that case. So I've, I've used one brown lead. That way I had that, avail that, uh, that other lead available for another function if I needed it. What I found was in the case of the bind button and throttle hold switches, you have two wires. Here's the bind button as an example. And all they do is ground out whenever you push the button. They actually just complete the circuit. So that signal wire goes to ground, closing the circuit, telling the computer, I want the bind on or off. Throttle hold works the same way. It's either on or off. So all you're doing is closing a circuit. So those circuits work a little bit differently. But as you're going through this, 
make sure to use a multimeter. Find out where your power is because your radio may look a little bit different than this. The color coding may be different. Find where the same signals are, the same uh, continuity is between ground and the power. And that'll help you isolate where the signal wire goes coming from each axis. The next step in the project is to complete the build of your Puma X. You're going to do this exactly like the directions say. All the wiring is very clearly labeled. What's really cool is from the factory, they have each cable labeled. So this is cable D, C, number one. And every place where they will plug in is going to go into the circuit board at the corresponding location. Everything is very clearly labeled. They did a great job with this. What we're going to do is utilize some of these cables, not all of them, but some of them, to wire up to our CAT6 cable that's going to go back to our radio. The problem is that as the wiring came from Amazon, how I ordered it, the color coding is a little bit different. So this is the three pin JST connector. As you can see, it plugs right into their stock wiring harness, but the color coding is different. So I'm gonna show you how to fix that so everything is consistent. So the trick to correcting the color coding on these JST connectors is going to be to simply remove and replace the wires and put them where you need to go. The way you're going to do this is my preferred method is use a pick and you're going to bend back these tabs just enough to release the connector. Once those are back, you can then put a little bit of pressure on it, pull them out and then replace them where you need them to go. So the black one's going to go here. And then the red one is going to go right back in here. Once those are back in place, take your pick, put a little bit of pressure on that tab to hold it down. I'll do the yellow one just in case that one came up a little bit. Give it a little tug and you're all done. In the same vein that we've talked about before, the difference between screwing around and science is going to be writing it down. Immortal words of Adam Savage. What I have here is a map of all the axes that the Puma X controls. The cables that are associated with each axis and labeling for the radio function that each cable will control. Since we're talking about specifically collective pitch helicopters, we don't normally use words like aileron, elevator, and rudder, but the radio does. And also the programming for the helicopter itself does. So we have to make some concessions when it comes to nomenclature. Over on the right side, I have which wire pair we're gonna use for each axis and which cable they're gonna go to. So I'm going to assign the X and the Y axis, or the aileron and elevator, to CAT1, along with the rudder axis, or the torque pedals. Cable 2, or CAT2, is going to have the Z axis, which is the pitch, or the collective. And this could also control the throttle. It just depends on how your, your model is programmed and what functions you choose to employ. Down here, for cable number one, this is going to be our four pin connector. We're only using a couple of wires out of that, and that's going to be on CAT2, and it's going to control the throttle hold and the bind buttons. Everything else we're going to leave plugged in just the way it is. We don't need it for this project anyway. Once the cables are built, you're going to end up with something that looks like this. So we have C, and cable number one, this is CAT2. On CAT1, we have A, B, and D. So these are the cables that are going to be the end product that we're going to create. By creating it this way and not, not tampering with any of the wiring that's actually in the Puma, when you go back to wanting to use your Puma as it was intended in virtual reality, all you have to do is unplug the wiring harnesses 
and then simply plug the cables back into the corresponding ports in the PC board. So here's a note on setting up your radio before we solder everything together. What I found is that both on the fourth generation Puma and to even a greater extent on the Puma X, the travel around center tends to be very small. And this is in comparison to the gimbals on our radio. So for instance, if I don't make any changes, I've got a very small travel, and here I'm using the aileron axis, around center. And this probably is not going to give us the control throws that we need. So what I'm going to do is go into my dual rates and expo. Right now I have expo, expo of zero, and this is our sensitivity around center. Normally we would add positive expo to make it a little softer around center if we're using our our gimbals on the radio. For this purpose, we're going to do something that's a little counterintuitive. And I'm actually going to go negative expo. And for the purposes of setting everything up, I'm going to go ahead and set 100 and 100 on each end. Then I'm going to go back to the monitor page. And what I'll see now is that I have almost 100% throw in each direction. This gives me a good starting point so I can now calibrate my flight controls and find the center position for each flight control mechanically as I build up the wiring harness. So now that we're approaching the, one of the more time consuming parts of the build. Once we have our CAT6 cable coming out of our radio, going into our pass-through connector, it's time to plug the other end into the other side of the pass-through and then wire up our connectors. So what I've done is I've taken, in this case, the rudder or the torque pedals. This is the lead coming out of the Puma. And I've attached some test connectors to each lead that I mapped out earlier and I wrote down. That way I can see if each function works the way it's supposed to. So right now I'm gonna use the rudder function, which is right there. It's a little bit hard to see, but you'll start to see that carrot move. And now I'm going to actually move the rudder pedals and I'm gonna make sure that carrot moves like I think it will. Now, you can reverse this if it's not moving the correct direction, which is an easy thing to do. What becomes more difficult is finding that top dead center. Right now, you can see that mechanically, my rudder pedals are centered. So this is, for all practical purposes, 90 degrees between this pedal and this bar. The way this comes shipped from the factory is with the magnets pretty close to center, but not exactly. And there's no reason for them to ship it exactly centered because you're going to do a calibration within the computer, first in Windows and then possibly even within each game or simulation that you use the Puma for. And as a result, the computer will calculate top dead center and it'll know where center is, where full right is, and full left. In our case, the radio doesn't have that ability. So what I'm gonna do is take this sensor apart. This is just a 3D printed spacer. On the back side, you'll see our Hall Effect sensor. There, now you can see it. And the way this works is we have our magnet, which is encased in this white 3D printed cover. Underneath that cover is a mounting bolt that it simply just slips onto. So it's the position of this mounting bolt that we need to change in order to find that top dead center. So if I kind of loosely put it all back together and you see there.
you can see right there, if you look at the monitor page, I can move it left and right, and that actually changes the position of the rudder. So that's how this works. It's actually physically connected to the rudder pedals. So what we have to do is take a 13 millimeter wrench and change the position of that bolt just enough where this magnet's pole lines up correctly with the sensor to find that top dead center. Where you have to be careful in all of this is that the way this is all constructed, this is a through bolt. So there's a, there's a nut on the bottom side of this as well. There's also a set nut here, and it's the tension between this set nut and the bolt that actually allows this bar to move with the rudder pedals. If this becomes too loose, the rudder pedal bar right here will actually move independently of the bolt. So this has to be super tight. So when you're doing this process, when you're going through this process, it's possible to get this loosened to the point where you think you have it all lined up and then you go to move the axis and the bolt stays stationary. That's not what you want because you will then lose your flight control. So it's incredibly important during this calibration process that this structure is tight. So when it comes to setup and, and calibration for the collective, and we turn our attention to the sensor that's mounted on the collective, I've already taken a couple of these bolts out just to speed things up. We're going to accomplish the calibration the same way we did on the other axis. So we still have to get this bolt lined up properly so our sensor will effectively center. But what we'll find is that relative to the radio, the sensor is actually 180 degrees out of phase. In order to fix that, if we flip the sensor over, right here we have a clockwise counterclockwise switch. What that does is reverse the sensing of this particular sensor. It's not a good idea to try to do this in the radio because the throttle channel does not like to be reversed. And if you have your pitch tied to your throttle, or if you're flying a, a fixed pitch model, the radio is not going to be happy and it will throw some other settings off. So this is a very nice feature that's included with this particular sensor board is the clockwise counterclockwise sensor. On the fourth generation Puma, I actually had to take the potentiometer apart and put it on the inside of the assembly. That gave me the same ability to reverse the sensing, and I was able to overcome it that way. The problem with doing that is I then lost the spring function that Pro Flight Trainer has built in to their system that allows a realistic feel with a little bit of feedback, just enough to stay in place and give it a, a real feel to it. When it comes to actually soldering everything together, once we have our test leads removed and we've determined where everything needs to go, what I like to do is prepare the CAT6 cable with heat shrink pre-positioned on each wire. And then I also like to use a little wire loom and some heat shrink on either end of that. That provides a nice clean connection and uh, some durability where you're not putting stress on the wires every time you plug and unplug them. So I've already pre-tinned these wires, which is simply adding a little solder. So the solder will flow to each side of the connection. And then what I'm going to do is come in and for instance, the, the ground is brown. Simply going to solder those together. And then I'm going to do the same thing for each other wire.
You don't have to go crazy with the solder. It's just a very small connection. And those with an engineering background would say, well, you need to do a physical connection first and then solder over. I found over, over time, this method works very, very well. Once that's done, you can simply slide your heat shrink over each wire. And before I put any heat to it, I would go back and plug this in and make sure that the wires are connected and doing exactly what you think they should do within the radio system. Once that's done and you're confident of your connection, come back with a heat gun or how, whatever heat source you want to use. I prefer a heat gun. You then repeat this process for every connection on this line. So this is cat one that we're dealing with. So on this uh, particular cable, we would solder all the connections that we need. And once that's done, then you simply slide over the wire loom and the heat shrink that you pre-positioned, heat that up, shrink it down, and then what we end up with is a nice clean wire or a nice clean cable with the connections that we need. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the switches located on the collective. There's two of them that we're going to access, and it's these two right here. This one is my throttle hold switch, where I have a fly position, which is the back position for me, and then hold, which is forward. That will cut the motor off, and it's right there at my thumb whenever I need it. It's a fail-safe switch. The switch right next to it controls the bind function on my radio, and what that does is it allows me to use my motion control system for my camera. So that's a video for another time. So to access the function of these two switches, there's four screws that are on the bottom of the collective. All you have to do is pull those out along with this four pin connector. This four pin connector is, is uh, cable number one as it goes back down to the PC board down on the uh, lower side of the Puma. What I've done is I've fashioned a wiring harness, a jumper cable that will utilize both the four pin connector and each of these two pin connectors. So I simply plug these in to my harness and then plug it in to cable number one, just like that, close it back up. And now I've bypassed the control board located within the collective. And I'm using the number one cable to carry the signals all the way down where I'm going to attach my own wiring harness. So once you're confident in your build, the next thing to do is go fly. I highly recommend starting with something that bounces. It's not going to hurt you or anything that's close to you. So I'm using this coaxial helicopter from Horizon Hobby. It's a oldie but a goodie. It's a Force RC combat helicopter. So my next selection is an MCPX from Horizon Hobby. This aircraft has a fully articulated swash plate. So as you can see, it moves with the cyclic control on the chair. It also has collective pitch, meaning that when I raise and lower the collective, it raises and lowers as well. Right now, the motor is in the safe mode. So that's how I'm keeping myself from uh, starting the motor when I don't want to. The other thing the helicopter has is a tail motor. As a result of that, I can't do a flight control check on 
the torque pedals because the motor actually has to be spinning in order for it to do its job. As a result of that, the helicopter will probably torque 90 degrees opposite the direction of the rotation, which is this way. And uh, that's just a normal characteristic of these little helicopters. The other thing you'll see is because this is a rigid rotor system and translating tendency or drift from the tail rotor, you'll actually see the helicopter go onto one skid before it lifts off. So all of that is very normal for this, this type of helicopter. And as you can see, as the tail motor stops turning, the helicopter starts to spin just because it has a little bit of torque left. All that is very normal for this helicopter. Anyway, once you get the settings figured out for this one, then it's time to move up again. So I wanted to add a quick word on radio settings for each helicopter. The coaxial helicopter, which is this one, which is inherently stable and actually can handle a lot of control deflection. I ended up with about ne negative 90 on the Expo for each axis. And then I actually turned the dual rates up to give my controls a little faster input to 125. And that fi I find that it, it flies really well on that setting. As we move over to the MCPX, on the other hand, this guy is much more maneuverable and uh, will end up basically flying upside down if, if you let it. And it also becomes very sensitive around center if the Expo is too high on the negative side. So I do have the dual rate turned up on that one as well, just to give it a little faster response off of center. And then I've got minus 75 on both the aileron and elevator. And then 100% on the rudder. So this gives me a, a pretty good flight feel. And again, these are just for the little machines. Now this helicopter is a T-Rex 700 made by Align Helicopters. It's, it's an older model. It was originally built as a 3D aerobatic helicopter. It flies really well that way. And I turned it into a first person view machine and I could do a whole video just on that. But for the purpose of the flight control system, what I wanted to show, if you take a look at the swash plate and the tail, now we have a really good demonstration of how the swash plate moves in conjunction with the cyclic controls, the pitch controls, and the torque controls. If you look over here, you can kind of, you can definitely see the uh, Pit, or the pitch change in the tail rotor, just like a full-size helicopter. So this is where we've incorporated everything that we've done, all the hard work that we've done into this machine so we can then go fly first-person view. And because this is a new system, I've been flying this helicopter since 2018 this way and uh, learned a lot of, along the way. I've been flying it with the Puma Generation 4 because this is a new build with the Puma X. I still want to get some more flight time on it. And uh, once I do that, there's a Huey sitting over there in the corner of the room. And uh, that one will be flown on this system next. So now we're out at the flying field, which just happens to be my front yard today. We're ready to set the system up for flight. Everything that we did inside is completely portable. All I have to do is plug in both Cat6 cables, make sure they're, they're in the right, they are in the right ports. Open up the case. And then I'm ready to turn the system on just like we did inside.
Now for the T-Rex 700, what I've elected to do is take a little bit different approach in that I've built the helicopter and I have tuned the helicopter and fly the helicopter all on a DX-9, which is separate from our chair radio. The reason I do that is so I can set up the helicopter and make sure that the machine flies like it's supposed to with a radio system that doesn't have all these other points of failure inherent in the chair. Then I wirelessly buddy box over to the DX-8. Both transmitters are right next to each other on a table. And I actually fly the helicopter through the chair, through the DX-8 wirelessly buddy box of the DX-9. It sounds really complicated and it is a little bit uh, complicated to set up, but I've been doing it this way since well, 2018 or so, many, many hours of flight time and I've had zero issues with this setup. A word on Expo set up for the T-Rex 700 through some trial and error and, and feel and flying. I've come up with 83% negative Expo on the aileron, the elevator, and then a negative 60 on the tail. The tail, I can fly in either rate mode, which is purely using the pedals, or in gyro mode, where the gyro is doing the work of the tail corrections. I've left that function over here on the DX9 and chosen not to put it over on the uh, DX8 because I found that going back and forth ended up a little bit glitchy. So I've chosen to uh, set up the, the wireless trainer on this side. So again, I do fly around in rate mode. So I, when I add collective or I add pitch in the main rotor, rotor system, I also have to add torque pedal. So after going through the build process using the Puma X to fly radio controlled aircraft compared to the Puma generation four, I gotta say, I really like this system. The differences with the flight control mechanisms using the Hall Effect sensor compared to rheostats is, I don't want to say night and day, but it's much more precise and much more consistent. I don't find myself hunting around for uh, specific positions on the cyclic and the collective like I do on this system. The other part that I like about it is its construction. It's a much more heavyweight construction, which is going to last a lot longer. And most of all, I like the ability to reverse the Hall Effect sensor. So on this unit, all I had to do was flip the clockwise counterclockwise switch, where on this unit, I actually had to take the rheostat and change it over to the inside to get the uh, orientation that I needed to comply with what the radio needed to see. So I hope that helps those that want to do this project. It's, uh, it's been a really fun project. It's, uh, it's very satisfying. And please leave your comments and questions down below. Have a great day.